Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to this next lesson in electromagnetic radiation and physical and chemical equilibrium. So grade 10s, we've been doing physical science, obviously, and we've been doing electromagnetic radiation for quite a while now. And as you remember, electromagnetic radiation is basically the entire transverse wave spectrum um, and it includes in this radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. They are other types of waves. These are just the ones that we are listing at the moment. So I'm going to do a couple of questions, exam type questions on our electromagnetic radiation because we've already done some and then I'm going to move on to chemistry and we're going to move on to physical and chemical change and we'll discuss it when we get there. Okay, so First of all, it says the diagram, these are all old exam paper questions, by the way. The diagram below represents the electromagnetic spectrum. You've got radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Now, the easiest way to remember this is that the gamma rays are the ones that are basically what turned the Hulk <laughs> into the Hulk. No, I'm kidding. Basically, this is your nuclear energy gamma rays. It come from the nuclear energy and from stuff that it automatically gives off radioactive waves, the radioactive material. So this is going to have a very high energy, very high energy, okay? Whereas radio waves, these guys have got a very long wavelength, okay, so they can go over mountains, so they've got a very long wavelength, but they have got a very low energy, very low energy. And remember the equation that E equals HF, also that V is equal to lambda F. Those are the two equations you need. This one here is basically Einstein's equation where E is equal to HF using Planck's constant and that the H is Planck's constant and this is the wave equation but the velocity of the wave is given by the wavelength times by the frequency and in this case the velocity of the wavelength is always the speed of light, which is C, which is going to be a lambda. So C is equal to lambda frequency. In this case, it's a constant, which is 3 times by 10 to the 8. Okay, so now it says, name the type of electromagnetic radiation that is the shortest wavelength and is used for satellite communication. So we must understand that electromagnetic radiation section is partly to do with understanding and partly to do with learning. So it wants to know which has the shortest wavelength. So you could learn that, but we could actually work it out as well. Because we've just said that the gamma rays have got the highest energy, right? If H is a Planck's constant and E has got a very high energy, what's its frequency going to be? Its frequency is going to be very big, okay? And if this frequency is very big, and the speed of light is a constant and what the wavelength has to be, it has to be very short. So the shortest wavelength has to be your gamma rays. Gamma rays, okay. Is used for satellite communication, that would be your microwaves, okay, your microwaves. Now that is something that you have to learn, is that your satellite communication is, you, is microwaves are used for satellite communication. And um, part of the reason that it's important that you know this is because I don't want you guys getting confused and we've spoken about it before, just because there are machines in our um, kitchen, that appliances in our kitchen that we use that we call microwaves, which happen to use microwaves to heat up the water in our food, which then cooks the food, doesn't mean that there aren't any other uses of the microwaves, so that's very important. Now it says state one difference between electromagnetic waves and sound waves. Well, electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, transverse waves, whereas sound waves, sound waves are longitudinal, longitudinal. A certain FM transmitter broadcasts radio waves on 100 megahertz. Okay, that big M stands for mega. 
megahertz. A certain FM transmitter broadcasts radio waves on 100 megahertz. Calculate the energy of a photon with this frequency. So we're going to be using this equation because we want the energy. So our equation is E is equal to HF. Now H is Planck's constant and it is on our formula sheet. It is 6 comma 63 times by 10 to the negative 34 joule second. Okay. The frequency is 100 megahertz. So you have to take that into consideration. So let me remind you how this works. If this is your SI unit, so it could be meters, could be liters, grams, um, or it could be hertz. Then we've got kilo, mega, actually it's kilo, mega, giga, kilo, mega, giga, giga, tera. Okay, and this side it is milli, micro, nano, and echo. But we don't care about these at the moment, we're just going to look at this. So we know that kilo is 10 to the 3. Mega is going to be 10 to the 6. Giga is 10 to the 9. And tera is 10 to the 12. So this is 100 times by 10 to the 6 hertz, because you have to use SI units when we're using this equation. So Let's do that. And I just want to get this out the way. So we're going to be using this equation here, E equals HF, E equals HF, where H is 6 comma 63 times by 10 to the negative 34, multiplied by the frequency, which is 100 times by 10 to the 6. Right, so let's now Okay, and oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to do the sound a second. Let me just get this out the way, shall I? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so this switch is on. So we're going to go 6.63 oh, 6 exponent, exponent, negative 34 multiplied by 100 exponent 6 equals and that becomes 6.63 times by 10 to the minus 26 so that is 6 comma 63 times by 10 to the minus 26 and then what is it measured in? We are calculating the energy and energy is measured in joules. There you go. Okay, so see what I mean by it being a combination of learning and calculation work and also working things out. Yeah, we could have worked out, we did work out which was the shortest wavelength as long as we knew that gamma rays were high energy. Yeah, we had to learn the fact that satellite communication uses microwaves. The reason it doesn't use radio waves is because the radio waves got such a long wavelength that they actually are reflected by the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so there we go, let's move on. So again, similar type of question, so you can kind of get a gist, but what's been nice for them, this one is they're actually very nice. They gave us the typical frequencies of your radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, UV, X-rays and gamma rays. So they've given us a typical frequency of them, okay? So these are the frequency. Remember again, E is equal to HF, these formula are on your formula sheet, and V is equal to lambda F, which in this case is C. I'm just putting it out there. Now it says, write down two properties of electromagnetic waves. One is that they are transverse. Do you agree? All electromagnetic waves are transverse. And two, they all travel at the speed of light in a vacuum. Light in a vacuum. Well, that's constant speed. Okay, done. Now it says which radiation has the highest energy? Well, we've just covered that. It's going to be your gamma rays again. 
so you can see the same type of questions come up over and over again. A certain radiation has an energy of 1.99 times the 10 to the minus 20. Identify the type of radiation associated with this energy. Okay, so this is kind of the same type of question we had in the last one, except that we're swapping it around. So we're going E is equal to HF, right? Well, this time we've got E. E is 1,99 times by 10 to the minus 20. We've got H, it is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. And we want F, we want F. So therefore we can say that EF is equal to E over H, do you agree? So therefore we can say F is equal to E, which is 1,99 times by 10 to the negative 20, all over H, which is 6,63 times by 10 to the negative 34, which equals, so let's get out our calculator and clear and go 1.99 exponent negative 20 equals divided by 6.63 exponent negative 34 equals and we get 3 times by 10 to the 13 so that is 3 times by 10 to the 13 and if you look over here we can see we want times 10 to the power of something so we don't really care about what the number is we're caring about the exponent in this case and if you look yeah yes 10 to 11 to the 10 to the 14 is infrared and that is the type of radiation associated with this energy because 10 to the 13 fits between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 14. Okay, not too bad, hey? Okay, last question. And again, you see the same type of questions. We've got UV rays, infrared, radio waves, X-rays and gamma rays. But do you notice here that they haven't actually placed them in order in the previous question they actually and the one before that? They placed them in order in this one. They haven't placed it in order. Okay, it says how are electromagnetic waves generated? Okay, so this is pure theory. You need to state that you've got an oscillating charge. Remember this? An oscillating charge causes a changing electric field, which in turn causes a changing magnetic field. Okay. Right, so now it wants to know which of the following these ones here from the list above, write down the waves that are used in a TV remote control, used to sterilize instruments in hospitals, used with the, have the greatest penetrating ability and used in the treatment of cancer. Okay, so using TV remote controls is going to be your infrared, your infrared, infrared rays. Okay, um, a hint, sometimes when you are looking at your TV remote control, you'll see that there's a little LED light that lights up and that LED light is red. Now, the only reason it's red is because they've chosen to use a red LED light. Okay, it's got nothing to do with the fact that infrared rays are being used. But it has helped you remember that infrared rays are what are being used in your TV remote control. In other words, there's one something, basically it has to have a line of sight, okay? In other words, unless it's reflected off something, I know that some remote controls, you can point it at the opposite wall and it by reflection will hit um, the, the actual um, st signal box that is actually on the TV and change the channel or whatever, but generally you have to have line of sight, okay? So that's one way of knowing this infrared. Um, yeah, okay, that's the main thing. And then obviously is the fact that it has to be within a certain amount of distance. You generally with infrared, because it has to be in line of sight, you can't um, take that remote control and take it down to, I don't know, the garage and then try and change the channels because it won't work. 
Okay, what is used to sterilize instruments in hospitals? You should know this from studying. This is your UV rays. Your ray, UV rays kill certain bacteria and therefore it uses this. Okay, with the greatest penetrating ability is your gamma rays. And they're also used in the treatment of cancer. Okay, radio waves aren't used because they don't have enough energy and x-rays are actually bad for us and so are gamma rays. But what they do is they use the gamma rays to target the um, cancer cells. Okay, so that's how they use it. Now, ultrasound is used to obtain an image of an unborn baby. Briefly explain why x-rays cannot be used for the same purpose. For the simple x-ray reason is that x-rays are absorbed by soft tissue and only x-rays are absorbed by soft tissue and they only reflect bones. So if you want to see the skeleton of the baby, then yes, you could use x-rays. But if you actually want to get an image of the unborn baby, then you cannot use it. You have to use ultrasound. Now it says an x-ray photon incident on the body has a wavelength of 2.1 times by 10 to the minus 9. So it's got a wavelength of 2.1 times by 10 to the minus 9 meters. It says, okay, it says calculate how much energy, energy, okay. Um, the photon imparts parts of the body. Okay, so we know that E is equal to HF, but we also know that V is equal to lambda F. Therefore, we can say that V, sorry, V lambda, oh, let's try again, V over lambda is equal to F. Therefore, I can substitute that into this, and I can say E is equal to HV over the wavelength. Okay, and now I'm going to erase the stuff on the left so that I can make it all pretty and I can actually write on this. So I'm going to say H equals Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times by 10 to the minus 34. Okay, V is the velocity, which is the speed of light. So it's going to be 3 times by 10 to the 8. The wavelength they give us, it is 2,1 times by 10 to the minus 9. And we want the energy. Therefore, we can say energy is equal to 6,63 times by 10 to the negative 34 multiplied by the velocity, which is 3 times by 10 to the 8, all divided by the wavelength, which is 2,1 times by 10 to the negative 9. Right, and then all we have to do is pop that in a calculator to get the energy. So let us get the calculator out. It's going to change pens again. So let's get the calculator out. And we're going to use the fraction button this time, just for fun. So we're going to go 6.63 exponent negative 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 all divided by 2.1 exponent negative 9 equals and that becomes 9.47 times by 10 to the negative 17. It equals 9,47 times by 10 to the negative 17 watt. It's joules. That is the amount of energy that one single photon imparts to the body. Right, interesting here. Okay, so now we're going to start on physical and chemical change. So what's important about this is obviously the fact that we're going to be going into chemistry and when we're looking at re when you're looking at reactions of your um, chemistry, you need to know the difference between physical changes and chemical changes, okay, because that's obviously how we describe chemical reactions. So first of all, let's discuss physical changes. First of all, this is a change in the physical properties, such as the volume, density, density, temperature, and conductivity. So this is actually a revision of stuff you should know from last year. 
but let's just go through it to make sure you know. Volume is basically a measure of the amount of space the substance fills. Okay, and it's generally measured in decimeters cubed. Decimeters cubed. Okay, that stands for decimeters. Okay, decimeters cubed. Density, density. Density is a measure of the amount of substance per unit volume. Okay, so it's how much stuff there is in a certain, a certain volume. Temperature obviously is to do with if it's getting hot or cold, but remember, and this you should know already, is that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy okay of the substance and kinetic energy remember is the energy from moving the energy from the particles moving moving and finally conductivity well it depends if this is heat conductivity or electrical conductivity if this is heat conductivity, it is how well heat is transferred and if it was electricity, it would be how well electricity is transferred. Okay, so those are four examples of physical properties that we should be looking at. Okay, when we look at physical change. Now, what you need to know is that, the, and we've spoken about this before, there's a difference between intramolecular bonds and intermolecular bonds. Your intramolecular bonds are the bonds within the molecule. Okay, and these aren't broken. If they were broken, it would mean that we're changing the chemistry and we're actually undergoing chemical change. But if we're going undergoing physical change, and not chemical change. Sorry, I keep wanting to sneeze and I keep trying not to sneeze in your ears. Okay, so intermolecular bonds they occur within the molecule and they're not broken. Whereas intermolecular bonds are the bonds between the molecules and they may be broken. So let's have a look at an example of a physical change. And one such example is phase change. In other words, we're going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So if you look over here, these are all water molecules. Yes, the blue bit is oxygen and the two yellow things are the hydrogens. And yeah, you've got ice, which is solid. You've got liquid water, okay, which is liquid. And then you had water vapor, which is the gas. And you can see here that even though this is changing from all these things, okay, it is going from ice to water to water vapor. And it's basically still going to be still water molecules, even though it's going through a phase change. So I just want to show you. Uh, never mind. Okay, I've, I'll show it to you in another place. That's why I don't worry about it. I was just going to see. Okay, so molecules are separated when water evaporates to form water vapor. The water molecules are disordered when the ice melts, and there is an energy change, but not as large as needed in a chemical change. Okay, so what we're saying is here yeah, is that to go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, there has been energy that has been used to break the intermolecular forces, okay? So the forces that hold the ice in a specific arrangement, um, the water particles, shall I say, in the ice in the solid phase, will be broken 
And then you end up with something like this, where the liquid molecules are moved quite close together. Okay, they move quite close together, but they've got quite strong, funny enough, hydrogen bonds. Okay. Um, whereas the water vapor, they've again still got water molecules, but they've got so much energy that they move independently from each other. So molecules are separated in the water evaporates to form the water vapor. The water molecules are disordered when ice melts and there's a huge chemical change. But what's important is the mass, the number of atoms and the molecules remain the same. That's important. The mass let me try again. The mass, the number of atoms, and the molecules remain the same. So you need to actually count to make sure they've stayed the same. If they have, then it's definitely a um, physical change. Now let's talk about chemical changes. So yeah, there is actually a change in which the chemical nature of the substance involves change. And there was new chemical substances are formed, which means existing bonds are broken and new bonds are formed and large amounts of energy are needed to break the bonds. And then um, obviously you do get some energy out, well hopefully you get some energy out when the new bonds are formed. But more energy is needed for chemical change than for physical change. It makes sense, eh? Because here we are breaking up the actual atoms or molecules. Okay, we're actually breaking them up from each other. Okay, so now there are two types of chemical change. Well, there are quite a few, but the main two types of chemical change are decomposition and synthesis. Okay, when it's exactly as the the names imply decomposition, decomposing means breaking apart. Okay, breaking apart, right? Whereas synthesis is the making of. Okay, the making of. So you can either look at chemical changes as decomposition where we're breaking the atoms and molecules up or synthesis where we are joining up together, forces together and making a new compound. Right, so let's talk decomposition. In this type of reaction, a compound breaks down into two or more new chemicals. Two or more new chemicals. Most decomposition reactions need lots of energy to break down the reactants. Okay, and you cannot do this. Right, so I was going to say to you that the most decomposition reactions need lots of energy to break down the reactants. So there are lots of ways that you can get this energy. The one is from heat. That's what we usually use. You can also say kinetic energy, which is stirring and electrical energy. Okay, well think about this. If we're trying to have a chemical reaction, we're trying to break things down. Effectively, when we cook something, we are breaking it down because we are changing the chemical nature of the bonds. So the food changes from something that is inedible to something that is edible. And we'll talk about maybe in an example or two we can talk about how the proteins etc are affected by the supply of heat okay but in the meantime when we are cooking there are three ways that we can get energy the one is heat and that's what we usually use for any type of con chemical conversion then there's kinetic energy in other words we can stir the pot Okay, and then obviously there's electrical energy where the electrical energy is converted into chemical energy. Okay, so now let's look at an example of a little video that I have here where they pass an electric current through acidified water and it breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen. So, I'm going to switch down the sound, you really don't need it. There we go. Sorry, but you really don't need to hear the music. Okay, so what they've got here is distilled water and they've got a power supply, all right? And they are going to basically send this power supply through the distilled water. And what you'll notice is that the one end there is hydrogen given off and the other end there is oxygen given off. So this is the top of the double bureau stand, okay? And we're going to have to eventually test to see which is being given off. But do you notice that the one has a lot more volume than the other? Okay, this is the amount given off, is that big gap. So now what they're going to do is they're going to collect that gas. 
Now remember that there are two ways to check for oxygen on, uh, on hydrogen. The one way to check for oxygen is to light it and it should burn. Okay, the way to check for hydrogen is also to light it and when it burns, then what's going to happen? Well, when we light it, it's going to pop, it's going to form an explosion. So oxygen, when it gets lit, it burns and hydrogen, when it lights up, is going to be explosive. Okay, so yeah, you can see they are testing this one. Okay, there you can see it's formed a little pop sound. Okay, whereas this is oxygen, okay, and when they light it, it's going to carry on burning. There's something else I'm just going to show you which is quite interesting. Remember that hydrogen is the least dense of all the elements. So you'll notice that they're collecting it with the tube in the upward position. And the reason for that is because hydrogen is less dense, it's going to go to the top. Whereas oxygen is a lot more dense. So what they do is that they actually put the test tube with the bottom facing down and then basically just bleed off the oxygen into the test tube. So that, yeah, the oxygen is collecting at the bottom. Okay, whereas there, a hydrogen was collecting at the top. And you will also notice over here where they know that a hydrogen is in here, that they face it downwards because we know that hydrogen is less um, dense and therefore will rise, whereas oxygen is more dense and will sink. And there you go, you can see that the oxygen continues to burn. Right, so those are examples of how we would take acidified water and break it down into hydrogen and oxygen and the thing I want to point out to you is that the fact that it's acidified water and the reason they acidified is simply to free up more hydrogens to make the reaction happen a bit quicker. Okay now let's talk about manganese hydrogen peroxide which breaks down into water and oxygen when a catalyst manganese dioxide is added. So we've got here hydrogen peroxide, okay? Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, so it's H2O2, the oxygens are next to each other. So it's H2O2, breaks down into water and an oxygen when a catalyst of manganese dioxide is added. So it breaks down, okay, into water and an oxygen molecule is formed. So this is how you would look at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So it's 2H2O goes to 2H2O plus oxygen. Now let's talk about synthesis reactions. Synthesis reactions are when we combine two or more reactants chemically to form one product. And this product will have different characteristics, chemical reactants, I mean characteristics to the reactants. Okay, so in other words, if I take sugar and I mix it with salt, then obviously that's a mixture, it's not a reaction at all. Okay, because they have um, different chemical properties. But if I had to um, have a reaction where I pour I don't know, hydrochloric acid into a solution of ammonium nitrate, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a totally different chemical coming out, okay? So it's going to have totally different chemical properties. Often, large amounts of energy in these reactions are a result, okay? So there's got, often there's large amounts of energy in these reactions either given or taken in to make the synthesis reaction occur. So let's talk about examples of a synthesis reaction. The one example is hydrogen reacts with oxygen to form water. Okay, so this is interesting. In the decomposition, just a second, in the decomposition, we took um, acidified water and we broke it down into hydrogen and oxygen, right? Now we're saying, oh look, we can take hydrogen, react it with oxygen to give us water. So you got H2O plus O2 gives you 2H2O and therefore there's a 2 in front of the hydrogen. So let's look at this little video of how we, and what you should do during this video is we're going to have oxygen gas and there is hydrogen gas and they're going to react with each other in a test tube and then they're going to 
you'll hopefully see some water molecules on the test tube. So let's have a look at it. Uh, okay, so first of all, sorry, I'm just switching it down because you guys can't really hear the sound. So when the two gases mix, there is a spark, okay? And the reason for that is because of the way hydrogen oxygen works. Okay, so there's the spark where they actually put the flame out and look what happens on the inside of the test tube. On the inside of the test tube, you have water vape or water droplets, okay? So therefore, we can say that an example of synthesis reaction is we take hydrogen and oxygen, we basically heat it up, or actually we don't even have to heat it up. We will, yeah, let's watch it again. By adding the flame, we're effectively heating it up and it forms a popping sound and then you get your water forming on the test tube. Okay, now, magnesium burns in oxygen to form magnesium oxide. I'm sure somewhere along the line, they would have shown you this reaction. You have magnesium that only reacts with oxygen in the air to form magnesium oxide. Okay, so let's watch this little video. So yeah, we've got a reaction of magnesium with oxygen. Now magnesium, I have to warn you, burns with a very bright white light, okay? And this must be very small and very clean magnesium because I've man never managed to get it to burn with a candle. And look how bright and white that light is. And grade tens, if you ever see any star um, type of light, um, I'm just trying to say, um, the star bursts from the fireworks, and you will see that they are bright white, then you will know that they've got magnesium. If they're yellow, they're sulfur. If they're green, they've got copper in them. But if they're bright white, they're star bursts, but star bursts with the um, fireworks, if they're bright white, then it means that they're burning magnesium. Okay, so in both reactions, energy in the form of heat was needed to start the reaction. Okay, that's important. So both reactions are actually exothermic. So they give off more energy than they initially take in. They both give off more energy. Right, now, the last thing I'm going to do today is just talk to you a little bit about um, hydrogen peroxide breaking up into water and oxygen. Um, actually, we've done this one already. Sorry, this is what I want to talk to you about, the conservation of atoms. So what you might have realized if you looked at these equations when we balance them is that we're actually balancing the number of atoms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And you need to know that there is a law called the conservation of mass, which basically says that the number of atoms that we start with has to equal the number of atoms that we end with. That's what it is, a conservation of mass. Right, so if you look on this side, we're just going to look at the number of atoms at the moment. Do you agree we've got four hydrogens? Four hydrogens because two times two is four. And we've got four oxygens, four oxygens. Two times two is four. Okay, now on this side, if we have a look at it, two times two is four hydrogens. And then all together we've got two oxygens plus two oxygens, which gives us four oxygens. So you can see from this equation that we have the same number of hydrogens and the same number of oxygens on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. Therefore, we can say that there was a conservation, conservation of matter. Right, great tens, please join me on Thursday and we will continue with these lessons. Have a great day.